My name is Michelle Williams, and I'm with the Florida Public Archaeology Network. This is my lecture called Weeds and Seeds, Dining on the Riches of Southeast Florida. What I want to talk about this evening is why South Florida is so unique, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, and its ability to provide nutrients and sustenance for its people. So at the time of European exploration, Florida was already full. We always talk about people, um, who are the people here at Contact? And for Southeast Florida, we had the Haga and the Tequesta in Southeast Florida. Many people know the Calusa because of better written records, but all of these groups were dining on these similar resources. So how do we know what they ate? It's not as direct as you would think. We don't have written records, so I can't read a book about what was for dinner 2,000 years ago. We don't have, um, pictures or photographs or some other way of telling this story. So one of the ways that we tell this story is with a field called zooarchaeology, which is the study of animal remains from archaeological sites. So this is a nice example of the type of animal bones we might find in the trash heap here in Florida from 2,000 years ago. You've got yourself some fish scales, some fish vertebrae, and what these zooarchaeologists do is they collect um, samples of modern animals so they can literally take the bones and sit them side by side and be able to identify a bone not just by a whole piece, but maybe just a little fragment of that piece is enough to be able to tell what that animal was. But more interesting, because it's what I do, is uh, studying the plant remains. And this is called paleoethnobotany. Paleoethnobotanist just means that I study old people plants. And the way that we study these is by removing charcoal from the soil and examining that under a microscope. So we're basing all the plants that people would have used for food, clothing, medicine, shelter, on fragments of plants that are most of them are less than a centimeter and most of them are less than two millimeters across. So again, we're doing this just like the zooarchaeologist did, looking at characteristics of modern plants and comparing them so we can identify them. So where do we look for this information? Most of the time we're looking someplace like this. This is a really nice, big, elaborate shell mitten out on the coast somewhere. Um, it doesn't look like much. It doesn't look like it has much of a story to tell. But really, what I want people to realize is this is what these shell mints would have looked like prehistorically. So these weren't people who were just humping up their trash in a pile and calling it done. These middens were actually designed to hold structures. They were designed to bury their dead. And they were made out of shell rather than limestone. So I'm going to go over about five different environments. And as I go over these, I also want you to think about Bonnet House and how this, the land that Bonnet House is on today has a lot of these pieces or has similar types of environments. The first one we, I want to talk about are tree islands. And these are the islands out in the middle of the Everglades. Here along the coast, sometimes we talk about hardwood hammocks having a similar environment. So in the rainy season, these little islands are completely accessible through aquatic means. They have a variety of arboreal species that would not live in the water. And this was the place that people went out and camped. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these tree islands, and nearly every one of them was utilized at one time or another. So what were they eating? That's what we're here to talk about. They were eating lots of animals that would have lived on those tree islands and moved between those tree islands during dry season. All of these animals can swim. We've all seen pictures of the deer swimming. We know raccoons are fine in the water. Um, and the possums, just stinky and delicious all the way around. So what plants would they have had? They would have had things like the kunti plant or zamnia. They would have been eating the acorns from live oaks using the wood of live oaks to make tools and houses and structures. And they obviously would have been using cabbage palm for all the things that it's good for, whether it's thatching your roof 
or eating the um, growing meristem of it here as a cabbage substitute. So obviously the other resource you can use while you're out there at your tree island is the Everglades themselves, the aquatic part of the Everglades. Um, historically the Everglades would have covered almost all of southeast Florida except for a little dune here and there was a transverse glade that came down through Fort Lauderdale. The Everglades again are two places in the wet season in the summer it's aquatic it's easy to move around through them in the winter it looks pretty much like Iowa and if you look very carefully there's water it's only that deep but that's enough to limit the species of plants that can actually survive in that water all year round, which is why the Everglades worked. They don't really work anymore. The Everglades, the major component out there is sawgrass, which is edible. Um, it's not tasty, but it's edible. Cattails, you can use the, um, the pollen from the cattail. You can use the root of the cattail and the base of the cattail they're all edible and actually the pollen is medicinal as well um, if you've ever eaten in a chinese restaurant you might have had the glory of lotus root soup or lotus fried lotus root and this is the american lotus which is common out in the everglades and finally this is a pond weed that also has a big tuber that could have been collected and consumed um, another resource that we would have had in Florida are the oceans and the ocean edges. So one thing about Bonnet House to remember is that even though this wouldn't have been in the Everglades, there is a transverse glade that came fairly close to here and moved on out towards the ocean. And I think that we can all hear the ocean and the ocean edge from here. Ocean and ocean edge is also a good resource for mangroves, the beaches, the estuaries, and the ability to go out to deep ocean. And I don't think I can emphasize enough that these were people who not just could move around the Everglades, but they were taking canoes out into deep oceans. In the ocean, you have the things we all still eat today. The number one resource, I really think, has to be oysters. And these oysters, the shells were then processed and used to make those mounds as well. So um, at one time, the image had been that people were living on trash heaps, but you can tell by looking at the mounds that they have processed the oysters differently than just to eat them. There would have been cocoa plums, which now we're using for hedges, but at that time would have been a good sweet fruit resource. There would have been things like sea grapes, which are huge here. Um, and sea grapes are actually quite tasty, but you have to be quicker than the iguanas to get to them. And finally, most Oceanside people eat some form of seaweed. And this is, it's important because there's a lot of nutrients that you don't find if you just eat the basis of your sawgrass. So seaweed, fresh fruits would have all added some variety and some, um, some nutrients that the other resources would not have. Another resource that we have quite close by here are the rivers and riverbanks. This is a picture of the Loxahatchee River. What's interesting about South Florida is the thing that's missing is fresh, portable water. So the trick would have been, you would have had all these animals, all of these plants, but finding something to drink could have been an issue. The plants that you would have had on the rivers and riverbanks are very similar to the things you would have had in the hammocks, very similar to the things you would have had on those tree islands, but there also would have been things like prickly pear cactuses. Um, and this, the fruits are edible, the pads are edible, and the pad is also used medicinally. Um, this is a muscadine grape, which are very tasty. Um, this is a different species of grape than the grape that you buy at the grocery store and was domesticated separately. And finally, this is super obscure. This here is called ground nut. And early accounts describe people gathering a number of tubers. This was one of them. It is in the same family as peanuts, but it's not a peanut. It's a ground nut. What I want you to notice is that there's no agriculture here in South Florida, and that's one of the things that makes this place so unique. That ability to use all of these resources without having those storable agricultural resources.